the first part needed to happen. We needed to become aware. We needed to start defending ourselves from, you know, the the the, the Chinese Communist Party predations you know, through globalization and the internet. But second stage, stage two, I'm really hopeful for, um, you know, in this next uh, administration, whoever is elected, that we really double down on the American people: STEM education, science and technology investment, infrastructure, manufacturing. All of those things are going to lead to tremendous economic growth. Build a secure, encrypted, nationwide internet for the American people that protects their data. In the eyes of retired Air Force General Robert Spaulding, what is the most powerful tactic the Chinese Communist regime uses to exert its influence on Taiwan, the U.S., and beyond? What was it like to see democracy in action during the recent Taiwan elections? Will they impact Beijing's calculations around invading Taiwan? What is the significance of the China Phase One trade deal? And what kind of enforcement measures does it have? And why is it critical that the U.S. not become complacent about the communist China threat? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelik. In this episode, we'll sit down with Robert Spaulding, who previously served as chief China strategist for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon, and also on the National Security Council. Currently, he is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. Rob Spaulding, it's great to have you back on American Thought Leaders. It's great to be back. Thank you. So, Rob, you went to Taiwan uh, recently to observe the election. What did you see there? I mean, it's an incredible result, but but wh what did you see? Well, it was um, it was actually quite exciting. We uh, we went to a uh, KMT last KMT campaign rally and the last DPP campaign rally, and both of them were boisterous and exciting, and, and people were generally excited, it seemed to be, about the election. Uh, and then, of course, I got to go to a polling station and, uh, and watch you know, people vote, and then uh, afterward, even more impressive was the way they do the counting. And okay. um, it's, very, um, it's very peculiar to uh, Taiwan, you know, uh, one person lifts up the ballot and calls out what it says, another person writes it out on the board. And then, but uh, even more interesting, uh, a, anybody from Taiwan, a citizen from Taiwan, can come in and, and dispute any ballot. And so, uh, in addition to myself and, and other folks that were in our team uh, there, there was um, people seated watching the vote count and people would wander in and wander out and it wasn't just um, you know old elderly people from the neighborhood it was also very young people and you know I got to talk to a few of them and and so I mean <clears throat> so for me uh, I've spent my entire career in the military and I used to be feel so privileged because I could vote via absentee ballot and I would you know, get my ballot in the mail, and I would I would check it and send it in. And so the first time I ever went to a polling place was in Taiwan. And okay, wow. And it was it was actually quite inspiring. And you know, so I kind of um, I kind of realized what I'd been missing. You know, because I think it's um, you know that whole process of going to the polling station. It's a really it's really a part of this idea that we have a representative government and to see the people of Taiwan so um, so uh, fully involved in the process and really excited to um, you know whether it's a KMT or DPP candidate they're going for uh, or one of the other um, uh, minor uh, parties just to have the opportunity to to register their vote and, and have a say in their democracy, I think. I mean, that whole process for me was incredibly inspiring. And you know, I'm also I'm kind of glad now that I'm retired and I'm going to be able to go to a polling place here for the first time. Um, you know, this year when we when we cast our votes for the election. So, and it also you know really for me made it more real the lie that I heard when I was in China, which is Chinese people can't have democracy. You know, it's not, you know, uh, you know, it would be too chaotic for China. And, and yet here, um, here in Taiwan, um, where we have a lot of Chinese that, that uh, escaped uh, the Chinese Communist Party in 1949, essentially have one of the most 
if not the most vibrant democracy in Asia, you know, putting the lie to that. It's just, I mean, so it was, for me, it was, it was an incredible experience and I'm, I'm thankful to have had that opportunity. It's really interesting because you, I think I saw you say that you have a kind of renewed confidence in, but you didn't say what, but it, you know, maybe in democracy, what I'm hearing, and then maybe in, you know, the hope for China. I, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think so, you know, as the, in this process that I've gone through the last five or six years trying to understand, you know, this competition, economic, financial, informational, political competition with China, where, you know, time after time I've heard um, from corporate America, from Wall Street, from others that, you know, our system is, is not working, it's failing, it's not a great system. Actually, the Chinese have a better system, and you know, very wealthy people in this country believe that we ought to adopt that system. And having lived there and understand the Chinese Communist Party, you know, it it, it, it can it can knock your confidence down. But when you when you can go to a young democracy like Taiwan, it kind of really gets you pumped up for for what we have, and and inspired and excited about that and excite, excited and inspired to defend that. And I think that's what, uh, that's what I was referring to. I mean, I'm, I'm completely revived and, and reinvigorated in this, in this campaign, which I think is a, gonna be a long campaign as we reestablish our, um, our identity as a, as a democratic nation that's, that's uh, fully committed to uh, prosperity, to, um, to freedom. And, and really promoting that, not just at home, but also abroad. You know, I want to get back to this idea. Every time I hear people, someone tell me that there are people of influence in this country and around the world that believe that the Chinese communist system is superior somehow, um, I, I don't even know what to say or think. So it always catches me off guard. But anyway, going back to Taiwan, three quarters of the country basically participated in this election. Right. And uh, um, it also feels like a kind of, spec to me, like a spectacular failure of Chinese Communist Party influence operations. And I know this is something that, that you're very interested in. I'm wondering if, you, if, if, if I'm reading this right, other people have said this, um, and what's your take? Well, I, I think that um, we have to understand that uh, for them it's the long game. And yes, there may be setbacks, but you know our challenge is not to get too confident during those setbacks and then take our eye off the ball. Because in that confidence, in that hubris that we tend to have uh, to believe that there are no challenges to democracy or capitalism as a you know as a way of uh, organizing our economic activity, then you know that's when they're going to seep in and and begin to to change people's minds and and they do it relentlessly. It does. It's not like they, you know. There's this tendency to believe here in the West that you can make them. Um, give up or make them, you know, essentially deter them, right, by, by just uh, showing, you know, once that, you, that, you, that you're on to them. And it has to be consistent. And it has to be consistent in the way that we challenge the Soviet Union's um, effort to really dominate um, Eurasia and, and really the world. The Chinese Communist Party is no different in terms of what it seeks to do, maybe in terms of how it portrays itself, or in terms of you know what are the what are the characteristics that are peculiar to um, the Chinese Communist Party, but at the end of the day, you know they want to see the suppression of the the freedoms and the principles that we find dear, and if we are not constantly vigilant, constantly fighting, constantly struggling to preserve what we got, and not just you know, prevent them from undermining it, but also strengthen our own societies, then, then we're going we're gonna to see a constant erosion that we've seen since the end of the Cold War. And I think, um, you know, we can't get too confident. We have to be, we have to be vigilant and we have to continue to move forward because they're not going to give up. 
the Chinese Communist Party has, you know, in these influence operations to any, you know, ma many, many countries around the world. They've been docu increasingly more documented. It's arguable that Taiwan, and many people have argued that it's the strongest in Taiwan. Um, and I'm wondering if you could offer how that actually happens. Well, I mean, it's really, it's really about money. Right, it's about the market pool of 1.4 billion Chinese and um, financial incentives, and um, the Chinese Communist Party uses that game over and over and over again. And so, um, you know, when when Taiwan uh, under Ma Ying-jeou started uh, reaching out to, um, you know, increase these economic ties with the Chinese Communist Party, there's billions of dollars invested in, in mainland China. Those, those investments create financial ties that then incentivize the people that invest that money to continue to, you want to nurture those because they don't want to lose their investment. Well, because the Chinese Communist Party has created this almost bear trap of a financial system, the money goes in but it can't go out, once you're in, you're in and you can't get out and so now um, you know, it's, it's almost like, you know, people are very hesitant to um, walk away from an investment that um, is, uh, that, they, that they see potentially uh, slipping away. And so they'll just, they'll double down. Uh, and that's what, you know, tends to happen. And so I think what happened in Taiwan um, is that, yes, there are those relationships, but then you have the, the majority of people in Taiwan that don't have the means to have billions of dollars invested in the mainland, and quite frankly, they want to <laughs> preserve their freedoms. It's the same thing here. The majority of people want to be free, and then you've got a few people that are heavily invested in, um, in, in China, and they're essentially captured by, that, by those investments, and so, um, you know, that's... It's a very simple process. It's about it's about greed. And so, you think? Would you say that these investment dollars, uh, as a form of influence, are more significant than all these other things? Like, for example, the buying, the investment in media that the Chinese Communist Party made in Taiwan, and and all so these I other think methods. those are effective. Yeah. Um, but they're only effective to the extent that you're not aware that that's what's going on. Okay. And so, um, you know, we. we Democracies tend to get distracted easily, and, and there's no there's no focusing element that comes from, you know, a totalitarian. Like, in, for instance, in China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party controls the media. So if they want the population focused on something, they're going to be focused on it. Uh, in the United States, it can be, you know, it's it can literally be uh, like the proverbial dog. You know, dog sees a squirrel, and that's the thing that they're focused on. And so our, our media environment can be quite distracting and can essentially draw people's gaze away from the what the Chinese Communist Party were, was doing. I think for this election in particular, uh, and, and especially with what's going on in Hong Kong, the people of Taiwan were very aware of what the Chinese Communist Party was doing. And so that awareness just, you know, once that's once that begins to happen, those, um, those things become far less relevant. It's when we're distracted, it's when we're focused on other things that it becomes, you know, a little bit more effective because, quite frankly, it comes in through um, your day-to-day -day life. You know, it's how you, it's the goods you purchase, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, it's the media you consume, it is, it is, it is not, you know, coming at you directly um, in your face, it's kind of coming at you from the, from the sides. And if you're focused on something else, then it's, then it's going to tend to be more, um, more, um, more successful. Use WeChat, use Baidu, you know, use Alibaba. Okay, those are great, but what, what do they bring with them? Well, they bring with them, uh, in this day and age, the ability to monitor uh, what you're doing, and then to begin to you know turn back, that back around and subtly influence your your um, daily habit patterns. You know, you mentioned Hong Kong. Um, that that was somehow uh, changed how the Taiwanese people thought. How significant was that in your view? 
I think it's really, uh, really strong because I think, um, you know, there's a kinship because, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, um, you know, has this idea of one country, two systems, and, you know, Hong Kong's the, the example of that, and, you know, the success of Hong Kong, you know, feeds into this idea that Taiwan could also be successful, and then, of course, you realize that the people of Hong Kong, you know, uh, completely repudiate one country, two systems now, and yet uh, Xi Jinping doubled down and said, "We're going to do one country, two systems for for Taiwan." I think it's just so. I just I think it just tied together for them. You know, the people of Hong Kong value their freedom. They don't want one country, two systems anymore because they realize the Chinese Communist Party is untrustworthy, and then the the Chinese Communist Party comes right you know, behind that and says, well, we want to do one country, two systems. And so I think it was, I think it was very, um, it was between the Chinese Communist Party and the people of Hong Kong, it was, Hong Kong was very um, relevant for this election. You know, you mentioned you went to the DPP and KMT rallies. These are the two dominant parties and the two dominant presidential candidates. I'm going to read a tweet that you wrote. Um, and just get you to elaborate a little bit. So you said, the Taiwan election is a vote against the CCP, but not necessarily a vote for President Ing Wen, so Tsai Ing Wen, because the DTP, DPP got less votes this time than in 2016. So this is a little bit of insider stuff, but it's... Yeah, well, I think it was what, what I meant to portray there was not necessarily for the DPP. This clearly was for Tsai Ing Wen because she got more votes than any president that's ever gotten in the history of Taiwan. And so the point is the DPP, when you go just on the straight party line vote, the DPP maybe got a half uh, million more votes than, um, than the KMT. So it wasn't a slant, you know, Tsai, Tsai, President Tsai got, you know, almost three million votes more than um, uh, um, Hong Yu. So uh, I think it's clearly a vote for Tsai, not necessarily a vote for the DPP. And clearly, uh, because of uh, Tsai's policy about being leaning uh, more towards the U.S. And, and less towards the Chinese Communist Party, it was clearly a vote against uh, the CCP. Well, so it's interesting because, um, you know, like here in America, typically the politics are portrayed as left and right, whereas in Taiwan, it it, it's not nearly that clear cut, right, mm -hmm. between the DPP and the KMT. I don't know, the, well, you, I mean, te yeah. technically, you could uh, stand in Taipei and look south, and then it would be left and right. So, <laughs> 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 left would be U.S., right would be China. It's been argued, right, that uh, you know, for example, some of the people that are KMT supporters, and there's of course quite quite uh, quite many of them. Uh, that voting for KMT isn't voting for being specifically pro-China. It's just a different kind of patriotic. Well, so th here's here's the KMT the challenge. In amongst the uh, older generation in the KMT, it was very much a pro-China um, uh, camp. But then the younger uh, folks of the KMT don't actually agree with that. And so I think um, the KMT as a party is is quite conflicted. And they have been for some time, and so and, and, and again, it stems from these, not just um, not just financial ties, but also cultural ties, um, because a lot of people come from came from uh, mainland China, particularly the older generation have an affinity for uh, mainland, and they and they um, and, that, and that, I think that came out in their politics. Unfortunately, um, the younger people realize, you know, particularly watching what's going on in Hong Kong. What that, what comes with that? I mean, there's a there's a price to pay for that allegiance to to China and the Chinese Communist Party, and the young people don't want that. So I think the KMT is going to have to do some soul searching because there's not a big you know army of uh, supporters if they continue to go down this route where um, you know they're they're hewing towards the mainland. I mean, the argument right is that. We need to protect Taiwan, right? Because there is this looming giant that can, you know, with, with huge power and who knows how much we can rely on the rest of the world. We have to protect ourselves. How do we do that? that those are the arguments I've heard. Do you think Taiwan can count on the U.S.? Oh, absolutely. I, and I think, 
you know, the Pacific, as the Indo-Pacific, as Taiwan goes, the Indo-Pacific goes. And I think, um, you know, it, it, is, it is a strategic um, uh, territory in terms of the entire region and defending the region. Uh, and I think it's, um, it, not only that, it's an important symbolic um, part of the region because, you know, if we're not there for Taiwan, does that mean we're also they're not there for Japan and, and South Korea and our other allies and partners in the region? There's a lot. There's a lot to say. The, the, you know, when you say, well, the United States would just abandon Taiwan, because then you're saying, well, we're we're essentially a, going to abandon Asia. And you know, as I think you know, we have a West Coast and an East Coast of the United States, and we're clearly. A Pacific nation and a Pacific power, and um, derive much of our economic um, uh, activity from the Pacific, and so we're not going to we're not going to just abandon that. And I think I think there's this there's this tendency um, for people to want to um, use that as an argument to hew closer to the mainland, and I think it's um, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't pass the logic test. Certainly for the United States, it doesn't pass a strategic interest test. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's a convenient argument for people to use to, I think, uh, lend weight to, you know, allowing Taiwan to fall under the sway of the Chinese Communist Party. In terms of, uh, you know, people have been arguing that the Taiwan-U.S. relationship is strengthening. I think there's, uh, com you know, compelling arguments for that. Um, what do you think of the current U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, and what would you recommend? Well, I, I do think that um, we we tended to, um, you know, downplay our relationship with Taiwan uh, in order to strengthen our ties with the Chinese Communist Party. Of course, the Chinese Communist Party re repudiates everything that we're about, and here's this little nation, you know, just off the, you know, 80 miles off the coast, that actually, you know, embraces everything that we're about. And so, they've been playing second fiddle to a, a totalitarian regime. And so, I think this administration <laughs> woke up and said, "Wait a second, why are we, why are we so close to a totalitarian regime when you got a thriving democracy right off the coast that's begging to have a stronger relationship?" And so, you know, it's about strengthening the ties, economic, financial, informational, and military ties with the people of Taiwan and the rest of the democracies in the region. The, is, and that is a way that we're going to, you know, preserve and protect not just, you know, uh, our democracy but other democracies around the world. We can't just we can't just sh shrink into ourselves and become an island unto ourselves because what will happen is, as we've seen before, authoritarianism, totalitarianism will continue to creep and creep and creep closer to our shores. And so, as has, you know, as was the, the essentially the strategy after the end of World War II, we have to continue to main, main uh, be engaged in democracies and promoting them, not just militarily, but economically, politically, socially, informationally, all of these different elements of, of uh, you know, the United States that make us who we are as a people and as a nation. These, these need to be uh, part of uh, our, our, our going out and our engagement abroad. And they ought to be a hell of a lot stronger with democracies than they ever, ever should be with a totalitarian regime. It's been argued that uh, we're kind of entering a potentially dangerous time period for Taiwan because, you know, the economic difficulties that China has put itself into are beginning to show. Perhaps Xi Jinping is being, you know, kind of put a bit against the wall. He needs to be strong. The, a past guest, Ian Easton, has told us about how the obsession that the Chinese military and, frankly, the whole Communist Party has with Taiwan and annexing it ultimately. Um, uh, of course, it would be, you know, disastrous if, if there was an invasion or something like that. But they're plan they're planning on it. It's in every it's in the numerous military playbooks, from what I understand. So, um, how does that look in your eyes? You know, military activity in the Pacific would be 
disastrous for the Chinese Communist Party. At, at, a, at a minimum, at a minimum, if, um, if they want to preserve their rule, I think they've got enough you know, infrastructure in the country and enough um, you know, economic activity that they can sustain themselves for a while as the rest of the free world begins to realize that, that they're a predatory economy and, and essentially prevent them from, from having access to those things. And they have enough uh, of a connection to emerging market economies that they can continue to squeeze more out of that. As soon as they start um, you know, conducting military actions uh, in the Indo-Pacific, all that comes to a screeching halt and they become severely isolated, not just economically, but financially in all uh, uh, manner. They need energy, they need dollars to buy food and raw materials, and as soon as they start uh, a conflict, that's gonna, all gonna come to a screeching halt. What they're able to do now by, by essentially not having you know, a military conflict, by portraying themselves as very peaceful, then they can continue to, to, to co-opt uh, many in the free world who are willing to, you know, for profit, you know, support their efforts. And so I don't put a lot of credence. So that's number one. Number two, nuclear weapons make um, that the prospect of, of conflict where the United States and the Chinese could potentially be involved, you know, far too risky for either the United States or China. Now, the great thing that, that, that Mao had um, that Xi Jinping does not have is that he had a very poor country with no infrastructure, no industry, really nothing. And so the prospect of um, a war with the United States could be more palatable than that when you, when you don't have, when you're essentially um, a developing country that has nothing to lose. Well, They're a developed country. They have everything to lose. They have massive cities. They have, they have uh, infrastructure. They have manufacturing. They have technology. They have all of these things that they've that they've spent trillions of dollars, a lot of it of our own money, to build. And 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 the Chinese Communist Party, I don't believe, has any intention to risk that in a military conflict with the United States, where um, where. Uh, you don't have uh, necessarily an understanding where that escalation ends. You know, years ago, I'm just recalling uh, uh, one of these Chinese generals, you know, once in a while a Chinese general comes out and says something very boisterous, and this was like kind of beyond the pale boisterous. I, th I forget whether it was west of Xi'an, but basically he said, we're, in a, we're ready to sacrifice a sizable portion of the population in nuclear conflict. I don't know if you remember this, but it was, it was beyond the beyond. So you don't think there's anything to this? Well, I mean, the, the, it, um, Mao is, uh, is rumored to have said something similar. But uh, again, the Chinese Communist Party has, you know, essentially witnessed the development on the backs of, quite frankly, the free world. Um, that's, that's unprecedented in history. Now, it doesn't really seem logical that they would put all of that at risk um, by creating a military conflict in the Indo-Pacific. So let's, let's talk about that development and uh, you know how some of that development has been slowing a lot by even the arguably very fudged indicators coming out of communist China. Um, we have a phase one trade deal just kind of freshly, freshly signed. Um, can you give us an overview of what, what, what this deal is about? What does it mean? It's probably the best deal that either side could have hoped to have um, and, and, and yet not be a deal. And so um, I, think, okay. I think the, uh, you know, what uh, they initially attempted to do was to forge uh, an agreement that would allow for this um, relationship to continue forward in a more balanced way. And of course the Chinese Communist Party had no interest in that. And so um, at the same time you see these you know, increasing tariffs and other elements uh, that the federal government is beginning to put in place that actually begin to defend our economy and our people and our society uh, from the Chinese Communist Party's predatory activity. 
And that's creating challenges for the Chinese Communist Party because it's, it's, um, it's leading to uh, loss of employment. And so, and then you've got uh, swine flu, you've got fall army worm, you've got rising food prices, um, you have um, slowing manufacturing activity, you have the moving supply chains, you have the, um, the, the lessening of the current account to where uh, the dollars that you need to buy energy, food, and raw materials is not there. And so I think uh, Xi Jinping sees all of these mounting economic and financial challenges coming, and uh, President Trump sees a, an election in 2020 coming and quite frankly is being bombarded by Wall Street and corporate America saying that if you don't get a deal, you're, you're going to lose the election. And so I think um, it's, it's not the deal that either side wanted. Um, and it's not the deal that China wanted because they've still got tariffs on $350 billion worth of goods. And they've just uh, said that they're going to spend hundreds of billion dollars on um, buying um, U.S. products. Now, the good news about that is they actually do need food, and so um, and that's going to help them stay in power by by importing pork and by importing soybeans. On the U.S. side, uh, we didn't get the, the problem with the agreement is the the fact that the Chinese Communist Party almost never uh, actually honors the agreement. And so the good news there is you have enforcement mechanisms that, um, and then the, the opportunity to raise tariffs if they don't actually come through. So, um, and the president can turn to corporate America and Wall Street and say, look guys, I got the best deal I could. Now, Goldman Sachs immediately came out uh, after the agreement and said, well, they still got tariffs on $350 billion worth of goods. This is not, a, this is not the deal that we were expecting. I think, um, I think that it fulfills um, both sides' needs politically, um, economically and financially. It will not, re 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 um, it will not um, result in a more balanced relationship between the U.S. and China because it's not, the, nego it's not the, the agreement that Lighthizer and Liu He originally negotiated that would have done that. Now, the problem and the reason the Chinese Communist Party could not accept that deal is it, begin, it begins to unwind their tentacles of control over the entire economy and financial system and that's just not uh, something that they're willing to do. You know, they, um, as you know, China has two uh, constitutions, their PRC constitution and the Chinese Communist Party constitution and the one that governs China and the one that governs the Chinese Communist Party is the Chinese Communist Party constitution. And that one really is about the preservation of the party and the way that the party maintains preservation is by maintaining control over the economy and, um, and they're not going to give that up. Yeah, there's a preponderance of evidence that, that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't live up to its, uh, you know, obligations, international obligations. Um, let's talk about the enforceability here. I think the president has talked a lot about that in recent days. Um, what is it in the deal that actually makes us feel secure that this will be enforceable? Well, I think the, the two things. One is there's already tariffs uh, remaining, and the, and the ability to um, to bring back more uh, if they don't uh, abide by it. I mean, the challenge uh, for the Chinese Communist Party is to um, undermine the free trade system by using you know predatory behavior both externally and then um, uh, anti-competitive behavior within the country. You know, tariffs are one element of a strategy needed to, to correct that. There's others. Um, I think those others, while they haven't been as much in the media, are also contributing to this um, moving of supply chains, CFIUS reform. Um, I think you're going to see an increase of the use of Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, particularly um, because uh, the Europeans um, uh, allow some uh, level of behavior that the United States doesn't. But China really, really is out there, um, you know, directly uh, paying people off to, to make deals for their companies. And so, 
if you use that, um, if you do that, and the, tr the, the method of transaction is a U.S. dollar, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, comes into play. And there's a whole host of other uh, measures that the federal government is taking to uh, strengthen um, this uh, the protection of globalization where Chinese Communist Party takes advantage of it. All of those uh, are coming into play. So it's not, ju not just the tariffs that are creating challenges for Xi Jinping and, and their economy. It's all the other things uh, in addition to the tariffs. And I think it's just going to continue to, to um, uh, grow. You know, the idea that our retirement system, that, that active military personnel's retirement system are going to be invested in uh, Chinese defense contractors that build the weapons that, that they may have to face someday is, you know, just beyond the pale. And I think uh, people are waking up to the fact that um, Chinese companies don't have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders. More that trumps uh, their responsibility to the Chinese Communist Party. That's that's Chinese law. It's written, um, and so and and that's that's certainly uh, Chinese corporate practice. And so when you look at uh, organizations like the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the and the um, and our um, and our markets and our investment banks, you know, pushing these uh, equities and bonds on to U.S. investors knowing very well that the, the, the most important constituency uh, for those companies is not the investor but rather the Chinese Communist Party is incredibly damaging. And I think you know, what's going to happen is people that have been pushing this, they're gonna, there's going to be a, a dark stain on their, um, on their career and record and certainly um, probably a lot of litigation that will come along with uh, all the hundreds of billions or you know trillions of dollars really of money that they have convinced you know um, retirement fund investors you know so institutional investors university endowments to put into China to uh, in spite of the fact that they don't actually have a fiduciary responsibility to them and oh by the way some of these companies are supporting things like concentration camps and forced organ harvesting of prisoners of conscience, which just adds an element of horror on top of you know disgust for not uh, paying attention to investor um, uh, prerogatives. Earlier, when we were talking about Taiwan, you mentioned you know money goes in but it can't come out, and that it sounds very ominous, and I, I understand it to be true. But can you, you explain how that works? I don't think that's very. We yeah, you know, so you know, one of the things that, um, if you remember a while back, uh, the IMF included the Renminbi B as part of its um, current basket of currencies and special special right. drawing rights, but it's a non-convertible currency. You can't just go, <laughs> you can't go, and there's no market to to trade your RMB for dollars. That's that is that exchange rate is controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, and so. It, you, there's no, you know, there's there's no open market for exchange of of that currency. Number one, number two, there's strict capital controls in China. So every uh, every transaction where RMB is flowing outside of China, the Chinese Communist Party has a handle on and controls strictly, which is which led to this, um, you know, this term, the Smurfs. The Smurfs were, uh, you know, essentially Chinese people that were taking fifty thousand dollars worth of renminbi in a suitcase outside of the country because that was the only way so they were smurfing it out and um, so but this is this is unprecedented uh, in in the financial world in other words there's no other financial system that is as close as as China's and so that's why you uh, you can't have a run on Chinese banks because Essentially, the Chinese have built a closed financial system that insulates themselves from market-based activity with regard to financial transactions. Now, that is like, um, it's like uh, building uh, a, a foot, so, you know, say you, you have two teams um, and, and one team has 50 players on a football field and the other team has 10 players. I mean, it's like, it, it, the 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 advantage that gives China in terms of being able to call the shots with regard to financial transactions is is um, is really enormous, 
and therefore it makes it very difficult for anybody you know to to really have a relationship with that that um, in a financial sense that can be considered anything other than one-sided on on the side of China so they have this massive leverage I just I'm thinking of the word leverage because you mentioned with respect to the trade deal that that when you think of the trade deal you just think leverage and if we have the leverage this you, you must all you must always have leverage in, in any kind of negotiation uh, with the Chinese Communist Party if you never if you if you ever reach a point where you don't have leverage they're gonna they're gonna take you to the cleaners the leverage in the trade deal is uh, the tariffs and some of these other mechanisms, the CFIUS and so forth that you, that you described. And earlier. further tariffs, you know, be, right. if they don't if they don't actually abide by the terms, then then more tariffs. You know, so, the, essentially, we forego tariffs uh, you know, on December fifteenth, and then we reduce uh, certain fifteen percent tariffs down to seven and a half percent as a condition of them signing the agreement. They don't abide by the agreement; those tariffs come back now. The entire play on the Chinese, the part of the Chinese Communist Party, was to get as many of those tariffs taken off for as long as they can. They're never going to sign a deal. They know that. So the best that they can do is to negotiate a deal where they can get, make sure that the December 15 tariffs don't happen, and they can get the other tariffs down. That, that's that's the best that they could hope to do, and they achieve that. And so uh, I think you know for them. Uh, it was a win it was the best win that they could that they could achieve. You know, it's not clearly what they wanted, but um. and I think it's a is it a there's like a 90 day window. If there's a complaint, then I think it's 75 days, and then another 15 days, and then the agreement can be canceled. Who who is who is actually doing the well not the enforcement but the assessment whether you know. That's a good question. I would imagine that uh, that's in the hands of the U.S. Trade Representative um, okay. to, to um, essentially monitor and then recommend to the president a reestablishment of tariffs. We'll do a deep dive into how that's actually working from the from the government perspective soon. So, what's the risk to America and potentially the free world with with, with this deal, or is there any? Uh, I actually wrote something for the Department of Defense that kind of um, talks about what's the what's the worst case scenario for the United States, and really the worst case scenario is uh, I go back to the, our prior conversation: don't take your eye off the ball, right? Because as soon as you take your eye off the ball, you, you lose your focus. They're gonna they're gonna swim back in and begin to put these connections in place, these financial, these economic, these informational connections that allow them to tighten the noose. And I think that's the the biggest danger is that we ever lose sight of what the Chinese Communist Party is. You know, there's this there's this belief that there's reformers and hawks, and if we could just get on the reformers, that you know they're actually. Uh, uh, they're actually um, closet, you know, Democrats that want democracy and freedom, and then the hawks are the ones that are causing all the problems. We just, right now, we're in the hawkish phase. If we could just get over to the reformers, everything would be fine. No, they're both part of the same party, and they both have the end state, the same end state in mind. They just have different tactics for getting there. You know, it's it's. Do you want good hide cop, and bad cop or it, yeah? It's like good cop, bad pop, cop. Do you want hide and bide or do you want in your face? You know, Xi Jinping's in your face. Deng Xiaoping was hide and bide until he needed to be in your face uh, with the Tiananmen massacre. So, you know, this is this is one of the um, beautiful lies that the American China watchers have essentially collaborated with. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party to perpetuate that somehow we can make a deal with the reformers and everything will uh, will be uh, okay. No, it'll just it'll just allow for them to have a little bit more time to insinuate themselves into our into our institutions to to further strengthen that relationship so they can begin to suppress again. And I think so. To me, it, it's not. I'm not worried about. You know, war in the Taiwan Strait. I'm not worried about war in the in the South China Sea. I'm worried about us forgetting what the Chinese Communist Party is and going back to the way things were, where we're not aware, and we let 10, 20, 30 years go by, and you know, every you know, suddenly you wake up one morning, 
and you're every single morning around the breakfast table you're reminding your children what they can say and what they can't say to prevent angering the Chinese Communist Party and bringing financial ruin on the family right essentially filtering everything you do as a citizen to make sure that you know you're not you not coming under the thumb the economic and financial and, and, and really this, this connectivity thumb of the Chinese Communist Party, which, uh, as I said in my book, uh, you know, with regard to Roy Jones, it is, it is already there. You know, we saw in the NBA, it is already there. And if we take our eye off the ball now, it will, it will strengthen. And as, particularly as, you know, we become more connected with, um, with uh, the, the wireless revolution that is 5G, and the data that it pr produces. You're going to see a uh, lessening of relevance of U.S. tech companies, a uh, strengthening of relevance of Chinese tech companies. You know, so Facebook, Amazon, Google will be re replaced by Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. And those will be the ones that are incentivizing us in our day-to-day -day activity. And as they strengthen their economic ties on the U.S. economy and other um, democracies, then they're going to be able to, to, to slowly incentivize our, uh, our freedoms away. Terrible vision <laughs> there, right? It's something I think very few freedom-loving people would like to see happen. How, how I, by oh, the yeah. way, yeah. I would hate to be a strategist, strategist right now in, in China because I can see this clearly in what they need to do, but then you'd go to Xi Jinping and say, well, you need to do all these things to kind of open up, bring, suck them in, and then you can, you can convert them later. And he'd be like, no, 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 we need to be tighter, we need to be stronger, we need to be more forceful. Like, no, that's not it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, hopefully. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not going to get you on their payroll, no. though. <laughs> um, how can these companies, uh, uh, and frankly, large investors that have invested these billions, if not trillions, into the Chinese system get their money back? They can't. The money's gone. It's been spent. So what happens next? They're going to have to take a ride down. Th and then that, that, that's just the, the truth. The, the Chinese economy is, you know, the, 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 the debt level uh, based on, you know, debt versus assets is, you know, it's three times. It's three, 300 percent. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a 40 trillion dollar plus debt level for about two trillion in assets there's it's excuse me 12 trillion in assets so I mean the, the money's not there is this the reason that Wall Street is so invested in maintaining the yes. status quo <laughs> yes you know but they but you know what they say um, if you find yourself at the bottom of a hole you know, and you're trying to get out, the first step that you take is to stop digging. To use a uh, financial anecdote, you know, or, or idiom is, you know, stop, stop throwing good money after bad. What do you expect will happen with this trade, with this trade deal? Now, you don't expect a final trade deal no. will, will happen. I think you've said that. Um, uh, how do you think this is going to play out? How do I hope it's going to play out, or how do I well, think it's going to play out? Why don't you say, how do you hope, and then, and then yeah, you can I, also I give think, us the other scenario. Yeah. I think what we're on a path right now of, um, of financial and economic decoupling. I think it's happening. I think there's so many people that don't want to acknowledge it's happening, but it is happening. Supply chains are moving. What hasn't happened is supply chains haven't begun to really fully move back to the United States in spite of the fact that we've got... Uh, the lowest energy costs in the OECD. We've got the lowest um, uh, corporate tax rates. We have opportunity zones all over the country. Clearly, there is a desire and a need um, to bring back, uh, for instance, manufacturing to the United States. We have we're, we're severely underinvested in infrastructure, five trillion dollars, and the civil engineers uh, rated a D in this country. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be done in the United States in terms of investment. We spend a lot on, on weapons, and, and so I'm hopeful that we're going to begin to turn, turn inward a little bit and begin to 
invest in our own country. So those retirement funds and those university endowments are going to invest in our own communities and provide jobs for, for people. And then, you know, our economy is going to begin to grow in a way that it hasn't for a long, long time. And I think, you know, the first part needed to happen. We needed to become aware. We needed to start defending ourselves from, you know, the, 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 the Chinese Communist Party predations through globalization and the internet. But second stage, stage two, I'm really hopeful for, um, you know, in this next uh, administration, whoever is elected, that we really double down on the American people. STEM education, science and technology investment, infrastructure, manufacturing, all of those things are going to lead to tremendous economic growth. Build a secure, encrypted, nationwide internet for the American people that protects their data. You know, Lithuania is the only country right now that's actually protecting, you know, all of its citizens in the internet. It's still not where it needs to be, and I'd like to see, you know, democracies really begin to understand the power of data to influence populations at the individual level and take um, take measures to uh, defend them um, uh, through a secure, encrypted, nationwide network. So, you know, you, of course, you're talking about, you know, the this 5G network of the future. You know, we, we this is, you know, a major topic for you. Something you've done an incredible amount of thinking about. Um, but wait, before but I, I would like to talk a little bit more about that. But before that, you said that's what you hope will happen. You, you know, you you've mentioned you're this decoupling advocate for all yeah. host of reasons. Uh, what what do you think the likely scenario is? Is it th is it that? Yes, I, I think it is, but, um, you know, I, I try to imagine um, FDR or, or uh, Marshall or Eisenhower, you know, particularly, um, you know, sitting there in front of the big board, which is still available in, in the UK to go and, and take a look at, you know, that, that, that's showing the invasion um, uh, prior to D-Day. And, um, and he sits down and he writes his resignation letter. So, you know, we're in a competition. We're in a competition for freedom in the world. And it's, it, it's not the same kind of bombs and bullets competition. It's about ones and zeros and dollars and cents. But it's a competition nevertheless. And so, just like Eisenhower was sitting there in front of that big board writing his resignation letter um, because he was, you know, really, and he, he believed that he was going to be successful, but he was also recognized that it, there's a risk of, of failure. You know, I think that's where I'm at. I, I see that, you know, I believe, I believe we're going to be successful. I'm, I'm fervently, I have faith in the American people and in our, in our system and in, in our government and our constitution. I have profound faith in that. But the Chinese Communist Party is, is every bit the the adversary that we, uh, quite frankly, have never been prepared for. And uh, if we take our eye off the ball, we might not make it. And so, uh, you know, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, a little bit. I mean, the bottom line from what I've heard you say is basically any final deal that the CCP would sign would be a death knell for the U.S. They're not going to sign right, any deal. Exactly. They, they, they're not going to sign a deal. That actually, um, that actually um, leads to, um, you know, the, the demise of the Chinese Communist Party, which is essentially, um, you know, counter to everything that we believe uh, as a as a people and as a nation. Basically, you're saying that fair rules would lead to the demise of the Chinese Communist right. Party. Right. A totalitarian system is never self-sustainable. Um, without the ability to reach out into other free societies for innovation, capital, technology, and talent. And I, and I think they're trying to craft one by, you know, using as much as they can and, and get it to, you know, almost like, you know, a, a, um, a sustained um, system. But it's unsustainable in that you know, in, in stifling the freedom and the creativity of a population, you stifle your own ability to, to grow your way out of challenges. And, and that's what they have. Now, they've been able to reach outside themselves uh, to us to help grow themselves out of challenges. You know, as we're aware that that's happening and that our own people are suffering, 
then that 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 their capability to do that diminishes, and there there is therein lies their um, their challenge of their system. So it is a closed system, it, and a closed system never works um, because you know people really uh, you know in their in their fiber want to be free, and they'll 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 give it up for a good job and a, and, a, and a roof over their head and, a, and a, the ability to send their kids to school and all the things that the Chinese Communist Party is promising. But as soon as those things start to slip, they're going to look around and say, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I supporting this? What is, what is in it for me? Let's talk a little bit about, before we finish up, about uh, 5G. Uh, and you know, I saw you wrote, uh, I guess, an open letter to the UK people in the Telegraph uh, recently. You're very worried, clearly, in that letter. And maybe, I mean, can we use that as a as a way just to kind of explain where things at are with respect to Chinese Communist Party, 5G development, Huawei, and then, you know, what are the, what, what is Britain getting itself into. Well, you know, it's funny because uh, the EU came up with this global data protection regulation because they were concerned about Facebook and, you know, uh, Google um, essentially using their citizens' data right. counter to their interests, right? They were, they were concerned about privacy. And, and um, what they have failed to grasp is that the tools and the technologies and the techniques and the business models that the Silicon Valley tech companies created has been completely adopted by the Chinese tech companies. Except they're not just, they just don't have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders like Google or Amazon or Facebook. They have a responsibility to the Chinese Communist Party. And I say in this letter, look, they're collecting this data. It's not stopping at the commercial level. It's going to intelligence collection and it's going to influence. That's the way their, their model works. And yet you're going to adopt them as your uh, commercial partners. Well, how do you think that's going to how the, how do you think that's going to result in the preservation of your own democracy? Now, you know th they use things like uh, you know the Snowden leaks for NSA and and all. The, you can call the United States whatever you want, but at the end of the day, we're not looking to subvert the freedoms of the people of UK. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you that the Chinese Communist Party is. And so if they're willing to, 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 to allow their politicians to lead them into this trap, in spite of the fact that clearly they know, because of GDPR, the power of these things to influence their own citizens, and now you're giving that power to a totalitarian regime, you know, it, it just it defies logic. But, you know, it's not the first time that, that politics has defied logic. Wow, that's a powerful place to add. Rob Spaulding, such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you.